Yep. Okay, good yep. evening, everyone. You're, you're very welcome to tonight's um, webinar, our, our kicking session on uh, tact tactical and technical point of view. So uh, we have a couple of experts on the end of the line this evening. One of them is Richie Murphy, the kicking coach with Ireland. And he's kindly agreed tonight to spend the next hour with us to give us his experience over the last few years with our, uh, the Irish team and underage rugby. And he's worked in Lynch before as well as an elite player development officer and in many different guises as well. He's played alongside myself and Damien and Simon. And Damien is in the background as well. And he's going to work on the questions as we go through them this evening as well. And Simon is going to jump in every now and again and give his opinion on some of the content that Richie's delivering. So... I'm delighted to see we have uh, at least 300 participants and they're still clocking up there. So we kick off now with Richie and we'll jump in every now and again with a couple of questions as we see fit. Could I just ask people to use the Q&A section, please, and not the chat section? Okay, thank you. All right, Richie, you can take over there. Okay, cheers, Dak. Um, look, it's, uh, it's nice to be, uh, to be here, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone sees what a nice day it is out there. So thanks for giving up the time. Hopefully, uh, over the next over the next hour or so, you'll get something out of this. But obviously, today, uh, as Decky was saying, we want to try and concentrate in and around the kicking game. I'm going to try and share my screen here, um, and I'm just going to check. That's okay, lads. You can see that, yeah. Tech. Yeah. Yeah. We're going. Yeah. Oh, see a perfect. Okay. Okay, so uh, just to start off uh, and get you guys thinking about things, just three very, very quick questions um, I want to ask. One is, as a coach, how important is a kicking game to your overall team performance? Um, if you have a think about that for a minute, um, it'll give you an idea of whether you're in the right, on the right track because today we're going to try and build that importance in and, and show you how kicking is uh, part of team attack. Do you encourage kicking in your training sessions? Um, I've, I've been at plenty of sessions over the years and, and seen guys saying, well, we're, we're actually only going to play, we want to play through the hands here, but we're actually taking out an element of the game and an element of attack. Uh, we were able to go, obviously, through teams, around teams, and over the top of teams. And uh, going over the top of teams includes, obviously, your kicking game. Some people might think kicking is negative. Um, hopefully, over the over the course of the next hour, we, 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 when we have a look through, hopefully we'll see that that's actually can be a positive as well. And um, it's a big part of the game, uh, especially the modern game now. Okay, so why is kicking so important? The statement there: kicking has a massive influence on who wins matches, and this is proved. This is a proven fact now. You know, if you look at in, in the international game. The teams that kick the most are the teams that tend to win. Uh, in a large majority of the games, the team that kicks the most wins the match. And that's not even, in, that's not even in count, uh, taken into account whether their kicking is accurate or good. It's actually the volume. Um, and obviously, it helps them control uh, field position and pressurize the opposition uh, through locking them down their end. And obviously, the quality of your kicking game is, is, how, is how you do that. It conserves energy at, at our end. So what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, I suppose we could, we could play five, six rooks. We could play a set piece. We could play three or four rooks in order to get a kick set up and then get into our kick chase. Well, if you're doing four or five of them a game, well, you're obviously using up a hell of a lot of energy at your end. So being nice and clean in, in relation to getting your set up right uh, and getting yourself out with a good kick on the back of a good chase line will, will, will hopefully come out with a good outcome. Okay, who's involved in that kicking game? And there's the answer, it's everybody. Everybody's involved. Whether, whether it's kick, whether it's attack or defense, the kicking game is linked to both of them. And it can't be looked at in isolation. So as we talked about kick attack earlier on, but kick attack may transition into defense, into kick chase and pressure on the opposition over the next few phases and how you get the ball back in a better position than, you're already, than you were before the kick. How, how do we do it? 
kicking has to become an integral part of team attack. And we talked about that just a minute ago. Okay, it's our ability to recognize space in the backfield, through the line, or around, or, or around the outside of the line. So it's still a very much a team attack philosophy of, of, of playing to the space. It's about good communication. And communication not all, isn't always talking or isn't always shouting in. Um, it might actually be pointing at the space. It might actually, you know what I mean? So there's something, it's, it's a way of communicating with your players and showing them where the space is that you're looking, you're looking for them to go to. The decision-making of the, the, the kicker himself, or the player in possession, um, whether to go to that space that, that has been seen by someone else or himself, and then can we execute? So if we see the space, if we get the communication in and we make the right decision, well, can we execute the technical side of the kick in order to get a good outcome? And today, this is what we're going to be having a look at, that technical, uh, that technical element and trying to show you how that fits into the next, the next thing, which is going to be coming up now in a second. Okay, don't get bored doing the right thing. If they're giving you space in the backfield and you take it once and you get a good outcome and they don't change, well, take it again. You know what I mean? So you always want to see how the opposition are going to react to whatever you throw at them. So if you decide that they're playing one in the backfield and, and you can kick into the, let's say, the right corner all day, you do it once and you get the ball bouncing out and touch. They don't change. Well, why not do it again? Do it until they change. And when they change, then you go to a different thing. So it keeps the, keeps the defenders guessing all the time. What options do we have? So if we are going to kick, it's based around five principles. We either kick to score. We kick to relieve pressure, relieve or apply pressure. We kick to gain territory, and you'll find that most of these will mix in with each other. We kick to regather, regather possession in a better position than we are previously. We kick to target or challenge players or systems that we're playing against. So they're the reasons why we, 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 we do what we do and when it comes to our kicking game. The guys asked me today, they asked me to talk in and around these, these areas. So, so the core skills of kicking is obviously the punt, high ball, grubber, chip, and box kick. And they're performed in, three different, in two different ways. They perform static, so a guy receiving a ball and then trying to generate, or a guy on the run. And they're slightly different, slightly different kicks, and, um, slightly different kicks, whether, whether you're dead static or, or whether, you're, whether you're up and running and moving. And we'll try and show you some, some of those uh, examples as we go as i go through okay if you look at the punt we can see that it's 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 around clearance kicking and it's around kick pass opportunities high balls is obviously a clearance kick um, and it's also an attacking opportunity grubber and chip kick looking more on the attacking side of the game and nine specialist box kick can be used in in, in both areas I'm going to show you the next clip and then what we're going to do is we're going to break out and go in to have a look a little bit at some, uh, some video footage. But the next clip, uh, obviously the five reasons why. So the next clip is going to be just how we build or the key factors that we would use when we're, when we're trying to um, develop a, a straight on drop punt. Okay, so you can see the picture of Andrew there. He's uh, caught the ball on the run and uh, he's just trying to play down the tram lines. Okay, so key factor analysis is, is actually very, very important for a coaching point of view. So to give you an example, face your target, slightly promote, facing your target, slightly promote your left side, staying tall with the ball in two hands, outside your knee, uh, around hip height. Uh, start building the momentum into the strike with small steps while staying tall, on ball release, flex the foot, in order to make good contact with the ball. Follow through then along the target line. I think if you were out on the pitch and you were trying to coach your player and you gave him all that information, I don't think he would actually remember very much of it. So it's really important that we try and abbreviate these down and make them really relevant to, to the player that we're, that we're trying to coach. Just there is roughly a ball position that we'd look for on the punt. If you can imagine you were uh, coming from left to right as you look at it 
uh, ball pointing away. Um, should be able to see the four panels on the top of the ball. So the joinings of the four panels, if you can't see the, the, four, the joining of the, the four panels, you'll probably find that the ball is too far away from you. It's, it's leaning too far forward. The coaching cues that I would use mainly with the players that I would work with, are some, here's some examples. You would never use them all um, and maybe just one or two things. So if a player, for instance, was, uh, for instance, was, was struggling with his strike, it could be a case that you, you're talking to him about on the laces. And if you're talking about something like a strike, there's also a feeling part to it and a sound part to it that are really important. So on the laces, how did that feel? Um, what was the sound like? You know what I mean? So obviously when, when we're kicking uh, a drop pump, we're looking for a dull thud rather than a slap. And uh, the feeling should be a nice solid contact on the top of the laces. So you're actually directing the player towards, um, towards the things that we want him to feel here um, um, as, as, as we go. You know, a follow through could be simple as uh, down the line or follow along. Um, so they're all the basic coaching cues that we would use for drop punt. What we will do is at the end of this today is we will send you on the other ones. I'm not going to read through each one of these because we're going to try and try and introduce these through, through video as we go. But again, side, side on drop punt is where you, you've turned to open up your body. Uh, a lot of people will do this when they're trying to kick longer distances. Um, whether it's, uh, it's uh, some people find this an easier kick rather than straight on. You know, the box kick, you know, the, the key factors again, and so on, coaching cues, chip kick, what we look at, coaching cues, uh, and the grubber. So they're the, they're the, the, the kicks that we're going to look at. Um, I think I'll just give Decky, I'll give this back to Decky for a minute. That's just my introduction. I'm going to go in and get some video here, and we'll get started then. Deck. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Free you guys to post some questions if you feel you have any that you want to ask Richie as he's just changing over his screen there. You can put them into the Q&A if, if needs be. Um, any questions at all, fire ahead. and We'll answer them throughout and at the end as well, please. Okay, Rich. Yeah, you can see that deck, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So as we were saying, uh, we want to just try and have a look through and see uh, see what it looks like see what some of those things look like. And again, just trying to, trying to relate these, these kicks to the, the principles, uh, the principles of, of, uh, of kicking. So the first up is kick the score. So here we have Dan Bigger. We can see there, and I know it's, he, it's only a, a small a picture of him, but he's nice and tall, long and strong in the upper body. Ball drop is pretty good. Contact point is very much on the laces and it's a follow along to the target. And everything there is working down along the target line to give, um, to give a really good opportunity to his winger. That, that kick would also very much link in with the other principle of kicking to target and opposition. Here we have another one, a slightly different picture. We'll see as it opens up. So what are we looking for? Okay, so we have uh, Emil Entomac here, and this was last year in the Six Nations. Uh, when he it was his first, I think it was his first or second game in, in, in the Six Nations, probably second game. He's you can see there's no one in the Scottish backfield with King Kinghorn here on the wing who's standing more or less square facing forward. He doesn't really have a threat because the the uh, the French outside player hasn't really flattened up to threaten that outside. So his positioning isn't very good. He takes one step forward. And Entomac manages to find the space in between them, which is, which is very clever. And the, the one thing that I, that I really like about Entomac is his ability to see the options and see the space in the backfield. Here we have another pitcher. And if we watch him as he goes, you can see that he's, he's scanning to see what's true in the backfield. We can see the, uh, the Italian uh, fullback who's playing over here. He's way out of position. They don't have anyone else in the, in the backfield. If, if you're in that situation, normally what would happen is the fullback or the last defender would come in and play in behind the ball. So if the ball is in the rook there, he'd be in behind the rook. He might then just try and follow 10 either side uh, as, the, as the ball is released. Entomac has seen that that's not there. He's got a call into his forward. 
you can see the communication. One of the hardest things to defend as a defensive, a defensive team is, a, is a, an attack formation that forms on the run. And you can see here down in the bottom corner, uh, we have um, Teddy Tomac coming back out to the edge. Look where his eyes are. He's looking up to see where the space is. And as he gets the ball, you can see he's pointing to the space. I think Antomac didn't need the help on this occasion and treads the ball through and wins the race into the corner. So again, kick the score. Another one of them. Okay, the other, the other thing that I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about, we talk about the, the grubber, okay, and we look at it from a technical point of view. The idea of the grubber, we want to try and get that ball as close to our foot as possible. So we're trying to press it and trying to get the ball almost below the short line, definitely below the hip, so that it's not traveling too far and we can get it through the space nice and quickly. So what we have here is an inside of the foot contact. Later on, uh, I'll show you an outside of the foot contact. So grubber kicks, uh, we probably, some of us will think it's just the same thing. Well, there's actually three or four different types um, depending on, on where you want the ball to go. Here, Bowden Barrett takes the ball to the line. It's not good enough just to be able to play it off your good foot. So his weaker foot is his left and it plays into that space. So that's a look, a look at the uh, sort of the kick to score, kick to regather can happen from both ends. We're looking here at a, an exit kick, goes high against South Africa. It gives his wing a great chance of getting into the contest. The, one, the other thing is the length of the kick is pretty good. Sort of 20, 25 meters gives his winger a great opportunity to get past the initial line in the defense and get up into the get up into the contest that looks different against Ireland and it's just a little lift over the top and again if we look at it from a technical point of view there's no movement in the upper body it's nice it's long and strong the ball drop is pretty good contact put on uh, contact point on the foot and the kicking leg back into his running stride as soon as he can so he's able to attack that space Here's an oldie, Dan Carter, and there's the one that we were talking about. So we've had two off the, in, uh, off the instep. Now we're getting one off the outside of the foot. And again, a little bit of animation in relation to he's moving his hands in order to try and disguise the late drop onto the foot and push through with the outside of the foot. Third, uh, third principle, kick to, uh, to gain uh, territory. We see here the South Africans kicking along, and uh, apologies that a lot of these kicks are Bowden Barrett, but uh, when, after the lads had asked me to uh, do this, uh, one of my hard drives, which has all, a lot of my kicking, fo my, my kick, coach, kick coaching uh, folders is, is actually in the office, which I can't get my hands on. We see here, balls transferred. Sorry. The Bowden Barrett. Okay, we see if you look at his eyes, he's initially catching the ball, he's looking straight up for the space. And what we'd call this is almost a straight on drop punt where he just turns, the ball's just outside the knee, outside the knee, left shoulders forward, strikes on the run and gets onto that kicking leg. So if you look, the contact, the next foot that goes onto the ground is his kicking leg to allow him to get into his stride and also uh, help him neutralize uh, that upper body. This one here, we see what's happening. Um, Entomek gets hit a little bit late and then nothing happens within the game. The ball is kicked long. I just want you to watch the English players as they come back. So we can see Entomek in the backfield, down injured. England players are there. They're having a look in behind. We can see George Ford now point, pointing back into that left corner. If we watch Teddy Tama, he, he kind of wanders back, but doesn't actually tell the 15 to go. And obviously, the Teddy, um, Entomac is down in the backfield. He changes his mind, gets the ball, and it's an easily ex executed kick into the corner to give good relief and a good use of... Uh, of, of, of playing on the top of uh, the, French being in, the French player being injured. 
we shift the ball a couple of times to try and get out. This is off a turnover. So that ball is turned over at the breakdown. And again, rather than having rooks at our end, we want to try and transfer the ball and get the ball down the other end of the park as quick as we can. And if we look at that from a technical point of view, you can see Andrew Conway, slight turn out of the body. There's the ball position. It's, it might even be slightly too far, uh, too pointed, but I reckon you can definitely see the first two panels. Whether you can see the outside two panels, I'm not quite sure. Good contact point on a flex foot or a hard foot through the ball. And again, into that kicking, into that running style straight away to, to get that ball into the space. Got three more clips, guys, and then I'll, we, we, we'll take a little break and try and get some questions. Again, ball transferred to the end, kick to apply pressure, the ball drop in the control off the foot, ball into the, into the space behind. One from last year. Johnny takes the ball nice and flat. We can see that picture that we were talking about a few minutes ago with, with, with one in the backfield, ten to be in behind the ball. You can, we'll see Colby here on the outside, and he's playing very high. There he is there. His body shape is open. He's trying to – basically, the winger stands there with his body shape open. He's trying to tell the ten that, yeah, I have, I have the attack, but I also have the defense but there's no way he's ever going to get back to this ball. And the whole idea there would be that ball trying to stay in play. So you're trying to aim for the fives um, so that if Toulouse do pick the ball up, well, there's only one place they can go. Last, last two clips, I think. I uh, just want you to have a look at this picture. Now we're looking at trying to exploit uh, the defensive system that a team are playing against us. So if we look there, what do we see? Well, we see a lot of space out here. And Ireland, this is Ireland actually, a training session, Ireland against Ulster uh, just before the lockdown. A lot of space in, out here. Look like we're setting up for the box kick. And what I'll do is I'll just flick that around just so you can see what happens. You can see Johnny actually comes late into the space. Kicks to the edge. Keith Earls plays down the touchline, makes the tackle, and the first two players there are, are Irish players. So if we look at where, my, uh, where the cursor is, we had a, um, a rook here, which was probably going to be a contestable box kick here. Whether we win that or not, we're not quite sure. But if we can play to the space, because that's what they've given us, and then get another kick in behind, the, 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 what's actually happening in a real game is probably a penalty. Uh, to us in this position here, which is obviously uh, a, a really good, um, a really good outcome from us. This one's again off the turnover. And you can see there's a big responsibility on the players getting their head up and seeing where the space is. What I love about this is obviously Bowden Barrett's right-footed. He plays it off. He's got the confidence and, and he's done the work that he's able to play it off his left. The other thing is, is that the other members of the team, if you look, where is he pointing? He's pointing into the, into the corner. And uh, Wasaki Naholo is on the edge and he's easily into the stride and, and uh, runs over the score. Last one. Um, if we look out here, we've got Dave Shanahan on the wing. Um, he's a very, very good scrum half, but... We've got a six foot four guy here on the wing uh, in um, in Jack O'Donoghue against a five foot six, maybe even five foot five. He's a bit like myself. He lies about his height. <laughs> it's easily beaten in the air, and we can play from a different position. I'm not saying that that is a really good kick. What we would probably prefer if that kick was a little bit further up the pitch to try and get us into it. But we've spotted a, a weakness in their system or one of their players and we've tried to attack it, which is, which is exactly what we're trying to do. Last one, and it's a similar picture. We've got a winger. We've got actually, uh, so this is Bowden Barrett. So the other Barrett's on, on the edge and we've got a player isolated in the backfield on his own. 
you get a pinpoint kick, we get up into the contest and, and win the ball pretty easily. Um, I'm going to come back out of that for a minute, lads. Thanks, Richie. Uh, Damien, do you want to field some questions that are coming in, please? Yeah, we've, we've a good lot of questions coming in already, Richie, and, and thanks yeah. very much for, for everything you've done there so far. It's top-notch, brilliant. Uh, I suppose one of the, the questions that's kind of coming in is in relation to kind of the, um, the, the spiral kick um, and relation to, you know, is it gone from the game, do you feel, or is it still a part of the game and are players still actively encouraged to, to train it and to use it if they see fit? Um, and also then another question that's going to come in <clears throat> is in relation to the, um, the kind of the transference of, of skills from other um, sports like the GAA football, uh, Aussie rules, um, soccer, etc. <clears throat> and just how that fits in in, in, in your psyche. Uh, I suppose just on the spiral, the spiral still has a very, it still has a place in the game. There's only a very few uh, players who are using it at the moment. Um, why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is, you know, going back a good few years ago, the drop punt came in as a way of training kickers how to kick straight through the ball. Um, and what happened over a period of time is it just actually took over from the spiral. And uh, the spiral kick is seen to be not as consistent as a drop punt. Um, but if you talk to any fullback, um, they will say that they would much prefer to see an out half uh, spiral the ball, or sorry, uh, punt the ball to him rather than spiral. So it still definitely has a part to play, or a place to play in the, in the game. I suppose what we have to try and do is, like, you know, for instance, Johnny Sexton will be, will be a guy who spiral who spoiled the ball uh, when he was young. And then when he came into Ireland at first and into Leinster at first, it was always part of his game. He does go for one every now and again, but it's probably not as uh, regularly as, as, as he'd like or we'd like. Um, the players do work on it. And so it's, it's mainly the tens, um, even though Jacob Stockdale would fancy a, f- fancy a crack at one every now and again. But what, we're, what we try to do is work on them in training. And then when we feel that the kick is, is, is solid under, under the, the training pressure, we try to introduce it to a game. One of the problems that happened with it going back a few years ago was an introduction of a different ball into the Pro 12. And, and the guys just felt that the, the sweet spot on it wasn't as big or as easy to get spiral on it as, um, as other balls. And, and, and that just put them off it. So... I do think it will come back in, in, in a form, but uh, yeah. it's definitely not there as much as, uh, as you'd like it to be. So it's up to the coaches to ring it back as well and coach the players. Yeah, yeah, well, it, yeah, the, definitely. And the, the, the thing about it is, is that it's not that different. If you look at, like, I could easily throw up a, a spiral key factors um, and some, some points, maybe we'll do that after this, but... The drop, the drop punt and the spiral isn't that dis- dissimilar. And in relation then to the kind of that transference of, of, of technique um, from other sports, have you noticed any trends there or anything well, kick- that comes to mind? Kicking, I do, I do believe uh, I, I, there's a couple of things. Obviously, Gaelic footballers, are, it's fantastic to see them coming into the game um, with their aerial skills. And they also have a good feeling about space um, the one thing that, that, that Gaelic footballers struggle a little bit with, I'm not saying they're not good kickers, but technically they kick the ball very differently than rugby players. Um, so trying to tighten them up, maybe get them on a, a straight on drop punt will be very uh, alien to them. They will be more used to kicking around the corner. And also foot positions um, they use in Gaelic will be, will be slightly different than we would. We would always talk about using a hard foot or a flex foot. So if you can think of my hand being a foot and the ball is here. We're, we're always kind of trying to extend those toes nice and long so that we get contact on the laces. Where even if you think of a Gaelic, uh, a Gaelic free taker, he actually uses his foot kind of in a different way. He wraps his foot around the ball and kicks around the, in order to bring the ball back. So it is slightly different, but, uh, but, but, but they do have a good skill set. I like soccer players playing rugby, uh, m- mainly for backs. Decky, you'd be glad to know. 
Uh, <laughs> Jackie's idea of kicking is kicking someone in the head so <laughs> back in my day. But, uh, I'm, but uh, that's going back a long time. Um, but soccer players, I do believe, uh, have a better uh, vision of this stuff that we're talking about. I think guys who play rugby all their life understand um, you know, the space through and the space around, and, and they see that space really well. I do think soccer players get a better idea of the space, the three-dimensional space, the space that's in behind the line. Brilliant. And just one other question. I see Simon's answer. He's put up the principles for people there as well. But there's a question from a nine's perspective, um, Richie. So my nine has a good contact on the ball and great height on the ball. However, each time he does not get the best distance on a box kick. How would you approach this as I'm unsure and how to help improve that? Uh, what I'll do is uh, I have one more video to actually show you guys and it's a breakdown of some of the skills that we've seen and it's a couple of young lads um, doing them. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to that video. The one thing that I would say is, and it's a, probably a question back to the, to the coach is what's the right distance? You know what I mean? So if you think about it, you know, um, you know, some people will, if I, if we ask that question and we ask people to fire in some answers, I would say we'd get anything from 20 meters to 40 meters. You know what I mean? So I think in relation to nines box kicking, all right. And, and the way we're sort of going at it, we want to try and get the nine to kick into the space. And the space might be in three different areas that the space might be long, which is a different kick. The space might be a contestable, which I would call a contestable. Uh, I would sort of say 20 to 25 meters has been a contestable. So we'd always tell our nines to try and kick at 22 meters. So if it's two meters long or two meters short, we're still going to be able to get into the contest. And, but there is a lot of space that's starting to come on the rugby pitch where people are playing two very much, very uh, determined lines. They're playing a, a deep backfield and they're playing a hard front line but they're not connected. So the front line is coming forward and the back line, the, 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 the corners or the, the backfield, the fence stay where they are. So that actual space in between the two lines gets really big. So a lot of space in there. So, you know, even, you know, a 10 meter or a 15 meter kick into that space might actually give you a, win the ball back without, without any contest. Okay. We'll push on, Simon, if you feel, feel free the next time if you want to jump in with some questions. You know, we can't answer them all, obviously. And I know Richie can't give away the secret sauce of the national team either, so just got to be careful. I just want to ask Richie a quick question. One of your earlier slides, you mentioned everyone's responsible for the kicking game. Um, what would be some key um, aspects that you would try and um, encourage for the rest of the team to ensure that you're kicking game is efficient or important or can have value? It's understanding. I think, I, I think, you know, when it comes down to the tactical side of the kicking, it comes down to the whole team understanding, well, actually, we're in a position now that we either, because of what the defence have given us, we need to kick, or, or for what's happened to our team, as in we've been put under a, have a lot of pressure, we're inside our own we're inside our own 22 and we need to get rid of the ball. So just recognition from the players on, on what the actual situation is at that particular time, I think is really important. In relation to the communication side of it, and that's one of the big things is, is that, you know, people that are playing outside of the inside backs, like nines tend to spend most of their time going rook to rook and they need to focus in on where the ball is. So as they're arriving to breakdowns, they're looking to see if there's stuff, but it's actually quite hard for them to see what's in the backfield. Ten's concentrating on the nine. He's also listening to what the guys are, have to say. And the guys outside of that are the guys who can see if there's space probably in the backfield. So wings and centers being able to communicate in or back rowers who are, who are playing in the wider channel. You know what I mean? There's no reason, there's no reason why this uh, your kicking game is, is only backs. The people who, uh, who read the game well, Need to, need to get their heads up and, and see where the space is. By all means, I'm not saying that everybody should be kicking the ball, um, but everyone has a part to play because if that ball is kicked, well, we have to transition very quickly into our kick chase and, and players then obviously have a, have a new role within the team, whether it's be to connect, get connected and, and, and get into the chase line. 
Very good. Okay. Um, well, just to give you an, an idea of, um, of, of, we obviously looked at the principles there of those kicks that we were looking at. So what I'll try and do is I'll try and give you an example, a, an example of some of those kicks. And then um, I'll also try and show you a little game that, that we play in order to try and sort of take the, the, the kicking skills side to it and, and put it under a bit of, bit of match pressure. So uh, here I'm going to show you, hopefully. Got that, lads? Yeah. Is that yep. okay? Yep. Yep. It's yeah, all there. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So here we're going to. I'm going to just show you um, a couple of a couple of different kicks, and there's no reason why um, a young lad who's on his own um, can't go out and, and do the, do some of this work, or you you as a coach can't direct him to, to what he needs to be doing. So in this particular occasion, what we're looking at is a, a, a drop punt. Um, the camera is more or less where he's kicking over. Um, so this is kind of a side-on drop punt. And when I was talking about side-on, I'm really talking about a 45-degree angle, roughly, of, uh, of approach to the target. All right, so one of the cues here would be, uh, could be, you know, target in mind. Because you can see... I'll just play this. You can see how Jack is concentrating on the target here and very much uh, trying to fix, fix in on the point. This could be a, a penalty line kick, but it also could be a quicker version of the space in the corner. He looks up, sees the space, and, and then sets himself accordingly. So he comes back. He's on that 45. He builds into the ball with, with small steps. Ball presentation is... B2B. So what I mean by B2B is belly button the ball. All right. So we want that all out in front at a comfortable distance in, in order to allow him kick through the ball. We look there on contact. We've got a flex foot. We've got a reasonably tall upper body. And we have a follow along down the target line. So if you think about what we discussed earlier, all those key factors, that could easily be shortened down into, into, in, into uh, a couple of key phrases. So here we have the same kick. So we can see he's trying to put the ball through the post, practicing a little bit of a line kicking. So you can see here, ball drop, pretty good. Contact point, good. And again, following along, down along the line, and, and, and the, outco the outcome is, is pretty good slightly left of where he would like to. So if I was going to correct that, I'd probably try and get him to just stay a little bit stronger on the left side. I'd say. So different kick here. He's trying to go drop punt down the line. Okay, he's on a tight angle. Okay, we can see the ball transfer on this kick. One of the key elements is that we get the ball outside the knee. The ball doesn't look to be quite outside. It looks slightly on the inside. And if you watch this left, left shoulder, it starts coming back on contact. You can see the hips rotating around. And that's why the kick has missed on that inside, on that inside line. So again, a correction for Jack will be, come on, Jack, get the ball outside. You know, um, it, could, it, it also could be target at 12, body at 1. So what I mean is, if you're thinking of a clock face, the, the target is 12 o'clock. So he can readjust his body to one o'clock and that will give him his left shoulder lead on that. And you see the ball drop falling slightly in. So that's a drill that could be used, um, could be used as a, a correction um, drill or it can also be used as a drill to work on your line kicking. Um, so if you're standing on a touch line and you've got maybe three or four balls or five balls, and you go five meters out, 10 meters out, 15 meters out, 20 meters out, and you try and put the ball through the post, well, you'll have got a 35 meter touch kick. So if you're standing inside your 22, you're now got a line out, out past in the other half. And I think most of the, most of the, of your other coaches will be happy with that. Okay, this one, what we're doing is looking at a little bit of a kick pass drill. So kick pass is, is another version of the straight on drop punt. On this occasion, what we're trying to do is get Jack to hit the red post pad on the outside, all right? So you could easily have yellow, red, 
and maybe even set up another cone further out or another cone further out that he's actually is able to try and aim at. The method here is try and go to the target, um, upper body long and strong, contact point on the laces. So he turns to the target, ball transfers to more or less straight in front and we really want that outside the knee. We get a decent strike, ball flight is pretty good and we get a, a decent outcome in relation to the kick. So again, that's trying to that that would be a kick trying to exploit the defensive system or the defensive positioning of of players where you're trying to get the ball to the edge as quick as you can. We saw a lot of little uh, little chip kicks and uh, grubber kicks and kick pass to the edge in in the previous video. So on this occasion, what we have is four balls. Jack sort of maybe 15 meters out off the try line, and what we're trying to do is stop the ball in the field of play or just over the try line. This one he tries to, he's playing obviously playing laterally across the pitch, but he's looking to try and go to the chip. Chip is a bit heavy and the ball goes a little bit too deep into the in goal. So trying to get him to pop it on his laces a little bit, trying to lift his foot rather than hitting out through it, trying to lift it over the thing. A high Gaelic football solo is a great, a great idea for a, a chip kick. If you think of Bowden Barrett's one that he had in the previous video, that's kind of what we've seen. We've got a kick pass, lands on the try line, about five meters in off the touch line, exactly what we're looking for. Going across, playing the grubber, and a little bit heavy, runs true, but if someone was on the edge and they were coming at that, they should have a great opportunity to maybe score there. A little bit of skies showing the ball, as if we're going to play across. It just plays off the instep again, trying to drop the, the height of the ball below the short line before the release and pushing the ball through the space. If you can do it on the right side, well, you need to be able to do it on the left as well. So left-footed kick pass to the edge, left-footed grubber, and again, decent weight on that, just going towards the corner. And the last one, left-footed grubber on a different line and just a little bit heavy. So they're, they're obviously um, drills that could be used uh, for uh, tens, back three, um, centers, any of those guys. Um, is there anything come up on, on that side? Is there anything you want to have a look at there? Um. Happy I think enough. we're in the technical aspects of the, the kick. Just a um, couple of the questions coming in, just mainly around how you can um, encourage kicking through the game or yep. through training yep. um, to give, uh, you know, the kickers or the people that are communicating to the kickers um, an opportunity. So it's just looking for examples around, yep. Yep, around that. Okay, well, I'll show you on the next one. I'll show you that uh, there's there's a game that we're going to play, and we also we've already seen some footage from from training where when we get into those training games that that we're actually trying to we're trying to play proper rugby, uh, which is obviously a three dimensional attack. So we've seen Johnny's kick pass from his own twenty two to 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 Keith Arrows on the edge, who decided to go back down in behind them, and you know they're they're, they're the perfect examples when we're when we're playing, when the game is playing, but if you, you as a coach tell the players that, well, we, we run, we pass, we rook, we run, we pass, we rook, you know, that's what the lads will do. You know what I mean? So if you say, did you not see that? Who's seen, who's seen the space? Where's the space? Is the space back there in the backfield? Um, you know, if you don't start highlighting that, that to them, well, then the players won't see it. And, they won't actually do it in training sessions. I'm just going to just look on, at this one. Just on the, on the last one, Richie, as an exercise, would you be calling out to Jack there, uh, you know, chip, grub, or, or cross field just really late so he reacts and adapts to the type of kick? Yeah, you definitely could. Like, that's just a drill. Um, to tell you the truth, uh, there's a couple of our internationals that are doing the, that exact same drill at the moment. And they're just trying to... and. It, it, 
it actually it looks so simple but it's actually quite difficult to do because you're only 15 meters out off the try line to try and get the ball to stay in the field of play or just barely cross the try line is actually very difficult and it takes a lot of control and um, so yeah he like we can call you can call out or what what he's trying to do is obviously bounce the ball to imagine that there's a there's a pass or there's a receiver possession what we don't have here is is obviously the pressure of the outside coming forward or where he would have to tread the ball through the space. So you could easily you could easily stick you know two cones here and here to go through that way, two cones yeah. here and here, or a cone on the edge just to give him um, just to give him a target. But uh, I think this was Monday or yesterday, uh, Monday or Tuesday when we when we done this. Uh, and we just really wanted to try and just capture a, a little bit of footage to, just to show the people what what okay. what they could do, you know. But yeah, definitely uh, from a coaching point of view, you can definitely call out whatever you want to them. Um, and the other thing is, you could even change feet. So, like, if he's just because he's coming this way, it doesn't mean he has to use his left foot. So he should be using his right foot, left foot, the other side, right foot, left foot. You know, left foot grubber, right foot kick pass. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you're trying to trying to make him react, I suppose, and put him under some sort of pressure. Okay. I'll go forward here and just go into the last thing because we we, we haven't really looked at the box kick, and I should have actually put uh, some box kicks into probably the kick to uh, kick to regather um, to kick to regather phase, and it was my mistake actually. I I just uh, I just left it out, so sorry about that. Um, so. There's a lot of talk about the technique in and around the box kick. Um, and there's key factors in the key factors and coaching cues in the, in the stuff that, I, that I've already done, uh, which will, which will uh, go, go out to you guys and you'll be able to have a look at it. But I thought the best way to try and do it is to have a look at a scrum half. So this, this view here is a very good view to, to see a scrum half from because uh, you can see a lot of the movements. Okay, so here we have foot on the ball so if we can imagine that there's a rook built over this in this area and he has to drag the ball back to the to, back to the edge um sorry just bear with me um so from here a left foot uh, he's obviously a right footed player um left foot nice and close to the ball he can touch the ball but you can't lift the ball off the ground um so once his hands are on the ball and the ball is still on the ground the ball is technically still in a rock as long as there's a foot over it. The right foot, a lot of people, some people will start with their feet in here uh, and then they'll go right foot out, left foot out. For me, it's let's get the first bit done as quick as possible. So get your right foot out. And again, you're trying to think about the alignment of where you want the box kick to go to. So the target in this, at this particular time is very much in the player's mind of the target of where he wants to kick it because this next foot has to go down in a position that allows him to keep his upper body reasonably reasonably tall to get the ball back into that area. So on takeaway, sorry, on takeaway, you can see the transition from that low position into a nice tall, long through the back, and nice tall, um, nice uh, straight ball drop, which allows, which is also straight. It's a B to B as well. It's a button to ball, straight out in front of him. It's not out here at his back leg, where the only way he can get it back into that corner is to lean back. And he kicks up through the ball. So I'm going to let that play. Okay. One of the things that this player is working on is to try and get that lat, this bit here out of it. So that little crunch at the end, it's not that important because the ball is already gone, but if we can keep him longer through, through, through the kick in the upper body, it just, it just eliminates any problems that he might have. You can see a small rotation to the, around towards the target with his hips finishing slightly upfield. If his hip, hips finish parallel to the touchline, that's great if this player obviously uh, after the kick will slightly rotate. Same player, same body position, foot, uh, two feet, foot more or less in line with the target, which is 22 meters away. 
again, good view of the, of the placement. Ball release, ball stays really still on the drop. Probably would like him to come a little bit further. So if you can imagine a, a saying of nose over toes, all right? So what we'd like him to be is a little bit, a little bit more uh, forward. But one thing I would say in his, is that kicking to the right touch line for a left footer is actually quite difficult from a box kick situation. And the tendency would be to find a position of that where you're slightly, slightly leaning back. Strike is up through and over, uh, up through towards the left shoulder. He's up through the ball and the outcome is pretty good. So that's the two, uh, that's, the, that's obviously uh, some drills easily for the nines. You know, how far is a good kick? For me, it's about 22 meters. If it goes a little bit further, further a little bit shorter, um, it's okay. What are we looking for? In an ideal world, we probably have a four second hang time so that we can get into the contest. Um, the other stuff is obviously a, little, a couple of little drills that we can, we can do in and around, in and around um, tens, twelves, and maybe even back three. Damien, anything? Yeah, no, Richie, you've, you've hit on a lot of the points and a lot of the questions that are coming in around kind of those kind of technical aspects of the different type of kick and especially how you can actually bring it to life whether for, for youth coaches, for youth players up to adult level as well. So you've, you've shown some really good examples there of how both players and coaches can, can integrate that into, into their training. Uh, just to, I suppose, I, know, I think I know the answer to the first question I'm going to ask you, but it's come in there. What would you say to coaches who tell the 10 not to kick the ball? I tell them they're missing out on a massive part of their team attack. There you go, good man. Yeah. I had a feeling that might be might be the answer. And my other my other my other thing is that he shouldn't only be talking to his ten when it comes to kicking. Um, if you think of if you think of the teams that are out there at the moment, you, you maybe even look at England, um, who who have the ability from ten and twelve to kick with with Ford and Farrell. Uh, Slade sometimes plays in the centre is obviously a left footer and Elliot Daly playing either on the wing or a full back they four probably world class kickers of the ball which makes them a very difficult team to play because obviously they might, they might throw, uh, they'll throw in a couple of really good runners with the ball as well so their, their ability to kick their ability to play through you their ability to play around you is, is really good and it makes it very difficult from a defending point of view Brilliant, no that's great um, and I, I know you've touched on a lot of the key factors there and, and also I know you're going to come to, you've shown some little activities and you're going to come to some game-based training there, which is another question that's coming up. So for, for the people logging on to be able to see it brought to life in training. But I suppose two-fold question here, if you don't mind. For, for a, a, a coach of, uh, and you've, you've seen a lot of underage rugby in club and school around the, around the country and in Leinster and et cetera, um, if you were a coach of another 14, under 15 player and the players tr pick up a rugby ball for the first time, which, what were the three main things you would maybe say to, to a, a coach to help the player kind of get their first real experience in kicking a ball? Well, the first thing I suppose is like, you know what I mean? It's chicken and egg really, isn't it? Because mm. like in order to be able to execute in a game, you have to be able to do the skill but there's no point in being able to do the skill if you can't see where the space is. So at that young age, I think if you could try and introduce the principle of uh, kicking to, uh, you know, to relieve pressure um, or apply pressure, you know what I mean, through you know, getting out of your end or finding a little, uh, little corner that you can actually play the ball into. And you know, from a coaching point of view, if they can start recognizing that and they can't execute the skill, well, it's up to you to teach him how to do the skill. Um, and it's also up to him to go and do, him or her, to go away and do the work in relation to, in relation to being able to nail it the next time. But, so it's a twofold thing. It's, one is getting them used to seeing the space. Two is obviously giving them the technical assistance and give them an opportunity in training to be able to execute that kick. Uh, and then when they're at home and they're on their own, you know, they need to be able to go get a ball or two balls and, and go and do their, their little bit of work on their kicking game. And if you were to say, right, there's a ball, show me how to kick. What, what say, 
three, what would the first three things that would come to mind just for, for that youth player? Like, well, the most, the, most important th- the most important thing, if you go back into the key factors, you go into coaching cues, one yeah. would be ball drop. You know what I mean? Ball drop. How, 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 what position should the ball be in as we're dropping it? And the second thing would be is contact point on the foot. If they can get those two things right straight away, well, the whole thing becomes very, very easy. You know Brilliant. what I mean? So uh, the coaching, the coaching, um, the coaching cues are 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 there, and maybe we should go back and have a look uh, at one or two of them. That might be might be something that makes more more sense to the guys now that they've yeah, actually seen some of the stuff. Uh, I, I'm gonna. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just show the game. I'll yeah, show please do very quickly, and then uh, we'll go back to that. Thanks for that. Uh, good okay, so I just pu- plucked out. Um, you can see that demo, yeah? You yeah, good? all there. All good. good. Okay, so I picked out a game. Normally, we, we play this game on a bigger pitch. Um, but this was the day uh, the Irish, Irish uh, seniors were playing with the Irish 20s, are training with the Irish 20s. So... This end of the pitch, the under twenties had the forwards are doing some line outs or some boring stuff like that up there, Decky. Um, and then <laughs> the backs are having a bit of fun in the middle, and that's usually the way things go. These players here are none and void. They shouldn't actually be on the pitch. I don't actually know what they're doing, and I don't think they know what they're doing on the pitch either. But what we're trying to do is play a game which which goes between the ten meter line and the twenty two. The try lines are on the fifteen. Okay, and there's kick zones which is the 15 to the touch line and the, the 10 meter line to the 22. So that whole area, the ball can be kicked into. So there's two ways to score in this game. One is to cross the 10 meter line, uh, sorry, the 15 meter line with, with the ball in your hand. The second way to score is by kicking it into that zone and getting it to bounce twice. So firstly, you, the very sharp one is very sharp people that are out there will notice that the red team have actually six players to start with and the referee here shouldn't be in a red bib either. Um, and the actual uh, non-bibs only have four on this first occasion. And the good thing about this is, is that the players actually look up and recognize and don't try and kick the ball because we don't want them to kick the ball if it's on to play. We only want them to kick the ball when it's on to kick the ball. So as we can see, the first pass is made. The, the defensive line is pretty broken. He plays a little reverse switch and he walks over the line. Again, doesn't, no need to touch down the ball, just drop it on the ground, tell the lads to go fetch. They decide to, t- to play out. So as they're playing out, we can see that this player isn't in the game. All right? And the idea of this game is that they should form some sort of a line and they should also have some sort of a backfield. And it's up to the attacking team then to be able to either play through the play through the line or kick into the space that's in behind. Here we have a player running up the middle of the park. He ends up in a bit of an alley. And because this game is a one-touch turnover game, he tries to go for the Hail Mary ball and it's intercepted. Luckily for him, it's intercepted. And then he gets touched, which means the ball goes back to the opposition. Because the ball is picked up in the opposition half, the ball comes back over the halfway line in order to be able to start the attack again. If this ball was in here, it would actually have to come back over the try line. So Johnny wants to go. He's told, get back. We go back behind the line, which brings the defensive line forward. You can see here that Billy, uh, this is Billy Burns in the backfield, is just trying to drop off to try and cover the space. Connor sees the space, but actually doesn't execute the kick particularly well. He should be trying to get it in here in order to get the two bounces. The ball bounces once and is easily gathered by Billy. He comes back out, sees the space in the opposite, in the opposite corner. The non-bibs player works really hard to get back into the space, gets it on one bounce. So again, no score. So still only 1-0 to the Reds. He goes for a long spiral, and maybe that's why we don't see enough of them at the moment. Contact, point, contact isn't, isn't very good. Billy Burns catches the ball, carries back towards the line, which engages the defenders and gives them the opportunity to play the ball in behind. And that's another point for his team. So the red team scored one, one point uh, by scoring a try and scored another point by kicking the ball over the defensive line and getting up the bounce twice in the backfield. So that's, 
that's another game that 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 that's another name game that can be played, um, and it's pretty easy uh, to set up. As I say, we you can definitely play at full width of the pitch. Um, so if you think about it, we had probably uh, what forty meters to play it in there. Um, playing full width of the pitch, you'd obviously have seventy meters. What we would do is probably have another couple of players. So we probably have seven aside. Um, with five guys playing in the in between um, the in between the 22 and the 10 meter line, and then two guys in the backfield. Obviously, the backfield in, on in that in that particular game would be the two 10 meter lines and the 22. That game I have on um, I have an explanation on that game, which which we'll send we'll send on to you. Are we okay, demo? Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I think that brings really shows uh, the people who are on here now how to bring it to life and also goes back to them as well to your principles and how like you can marry so many of your principles into that one one game you know definitely yeah yeah would you encourage would you encourage uh, coaches to bring forwards into that game (laughs) not if it's Deco Brian well, that's um, a good <laughs> <laughs> so we're um, taking drop goals before training. No? <laughs> um, yeah, look, there's no reason why back rowers couldn't couldn't slot in there and play a bit of it. We tend to play when the forwards are doing the scrums and they're 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 uh, getting hot and sweaty. We tend to play that because it's a bit of fun, and then the backs can have a latte and a and a, and a, and a chocolate finger as well, like you know, so nice and nice and easy. Just go back to this, the question because it seems to, the question that you asked me just before we, we started. So um, it seemed to be around, uh, before I showed that, it seemed to be in and around the key. For, how do I coach? How do I coach? Mm, just, these, pages, these pages tell you how to coach. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? The other thing that's really important from a coach's point of view, if you've never kicked the ball before, don't be afraid not to don't be afraid to tell the guys well don't be afraid to try but try away from your team um, to, to, to learn the skill but you know when you're in training if you're not a, not capable of doing it don't be afraid to get somebody who you feel is capable to show them um, how to do it how, show your players how you do how to do it and so again, that's that peer coaching and getting help from your from your teammates yeah. exactly exactly um, like uh that's, you know, obviously I use the two lads um, to show the example of, of some of the coaching uh, coaching points. I didn't do it myself because I can box kick and I can punt, but it's more realistic when it's someone of the age of the players that, that you're going to be coaching is doing. It. Um, so, again, going back into the coaching side of it is, can you see that, guys? Yeah? Are you looking at that? No? Not yet, no. Uh, sorry. No. Yeah, I knew. There was always going to be one set. I, I didn't put it up, wasn't it? Um, so there you go. That's it. Yeah. So we look at the thing. So we look at the coaching key factors. So that explains the skill in itself. So we look. If you if you if you get these pages and you take them out and you sit them down beside you and you look at the particular kicks, you'll be able to say, "Oh, facing the target." You know what I mean? Uh, he's nice and tall. He's balls. The balls in two hands. The balls outside his knee. You know what I mean? Of his kicking leg, and it's around hip height. You know, uh, he's building momentum into the strike. He's taking, you know, with controlled steps. You know, he's staying tall on ball release. He's trying to flex his foot. If you look at Andrew Conway's foot there, it's very much flexed in a flex position, extended uh, as far as it can, it can be. You know, he follows through by going along to the target. So they're the, they're the cues. Um, or the abbreviated versions of them. Unfortunately, the screen is covered here for me. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, so there we have. So you know, um, target in mind. Like you know, one thing that that really bugs me is that I think a lot of the players spend loads of time worrying about you know the contact point on the ball. The you know the drop, but very few of them actually concentrate on getting a good alignment. You know what I mean. If you want to kick the ball into a particular area, you've got to get yourself set up right first. And uh, I know that in in the field of play, you don't necessarily have loads of time for that, but uh, it's a really important part and and something that they have to get used to from a very early stage. 
Sky demo. Yeah, no, I think that's that's hit the nail on the head. And again, as you've, you've kindly said, we'll share all these uh, key factor slides as well out with everyone that want, wishes to have them. So for, for those people asking for that more technical detail, it, it is there. So we, we'll get that out to you. Well, one quick question before I let Decky or, or Simon uh, jump in there. Uh, is in relation to um, your thoughts on, especially that kind of school and, and, and youth level, whereby, you know, Kicking may not be encouraged in session or, or coaches may be saying to their kids, like, you know, well, you can do your kicking practice at the end or you do your kicking practice at, at, at the start. What are your thoughts about actually having it in, in game? And obviously you've shown some really good examples, but in training and the benefits of, of saying and the time that actually we should apportion to the skill um, as well. Yeah, um, I de definitely think there's, 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 a, there's a couple of things in that. Um, I know from our point of view, like you think of an international rugby team, you say, oh, well, they could train all day. The reality of that is very different. Uh, the reality is, is that a, uh, an international team will do some prep work on a Monday, will probably train fully on a Tuesday, if, especially if they played an international the week before. They'll do some prep work on a Monday, uh, which will be very light and low key. They'll do some, um, a proper training session on a Tuesday. They may have the Wednesday off, or they may train Wednesday and have Thursday off. Probably train uh, Wednesday off, train Thursday fully, but for a shorter uh, period of time. The captains run on a Friday and a play on the Saturday. So realistically, we're talking about two pillar days. We're talking about two days in the middle of the week where where you do most of your work. So players have to one take a little bit of ownership and work on their skills around the training sessions, which I totally agree with. But they can't, you can't do the, te the tactical side of it on your own. You can do a technical side of it on your own and understand the key factors and the coaching cues and, and execute on them. But you must put them, give them an opportunity to be able to do that on, in the game. So, for instance, if, you know, if your back line were working on back attack and, and, your, forwards were, um, and your forwards were doing scrums or lineouts, well... You know, why can't kick attack be part of um, that attacking strategy? You know what I mean? You might have a very good winger who's very good in the air or you know, very quick and you can set up a play in relation to, you know, him, uh, the 10, the 12, exploiting the space on the edge. So it definitely has to be part of both. Oh, great answer. Thanks very much. Simon, do you have anything there? Yeah, just got one question that came in, um, and they're just talking about how to generate um, more power through the range of the kick, um, both probably in the age group um, kind of space, but also in the women's game. So how would you generate more um, power so that obviously I suppose the, the kick can travel further? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a difficult thing. Uh, there's no doubt it's a difficult thing to do. Like power become, like distance comes from like definitely comes from strength, but also comes from timing um, and being able to use your upper body as a, as a, as a pillar uh, for you. Cause like, if you think of a, a kick, it's a violent action in the lower part of your body, but your upper part, part of your body should be tall and strong. So, you know, making sure that we're using our abs um, uh, to lock down the core um, upper body, so that we have something nice and solid to kick off is really, really important. And trying to improve the range of movements. So, you know, you're talking about maybe going, like a lot of physios will, 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 will be able to help with that, but a range of movements. So getting a, you know, the wider the range of movement is through the ball, you know, the more, gen, the, the more speed you're going to generate and the further the ball's going to go. It's a very hard one to explain why we're sitting here so the first the first thing i would say is work on your core getting your core nice and tall and strong and then allowing yourself to release that lower leg through the ball but you got to remember that in order to kick far doesn't mean you go hard at the ball but in order to kick far it means that you build through the ball so in color terms if you could think of your jog and as you're starting you know you're probably a yellow and yellow color and as you're getting closer to the ball you're transferring yellow into orange and as you're getting close to the strike then you're at red and you're at red through the strike and you're at red into the follow through so the fastest point is is through the ball 
Very good. Um, one further question came in just around the tactical side of the game. Teams are starting to kick, um, move the ball to the edges and kick. Um, any idea where that trend came from or the reasons why? It's been, it's been there a long time. It's, it's, about, re, it's about moving the backfield. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very useful tool. Like I can remember when I was coaching back in Leinster, um, you know, we, we used to use it quite a lot off a restart. Um, it was around Joe's, Joe's time back in, you know, I think it was the year that we won the Amelin. I think we actually scored a try from it in the Amelin Cup final where we caught the ball off a restart on the left touchline. We moved it all the way across, which was, which was a strategy in the game, all the way across to Issa on the left. The, uh, the, the fullback then has to come up from the backfield. He kicks long over the fullback's head. And, who, well, who can get to that ball? It's actually the only one other person is the guy who's in the far corner, which, which was actually the 10, who, was, who we knew was quite lazy and didn't cover that space. So we ended up getting back into that space. And so it's been around a long time. And it's about, the, it's about not being predictable uh, in attack. And it's also about moving the, moving the defense so that you can get a better outcome. Recommended um, practice time frame per week for a youth player, ballpark, by themselves? It's, it's a difficult one because it, it, it also depends on, you know, I, I, would, I would suggest that all backs should be doing some practice of some sort. I would say nines and tens should be doing more than centers because they've other things to worry about. Back three players is a very important part of the game especially if you're going to play at an elite level. Uh, so, you know, I'd say little, three little windows outside of your, outside of your, um, your, your training sessions will be, will be fantastic. And they might be 15 to 20 minutes. But what we want in them is to be purposeful, purposeful practice. So you're, if you're going to do something, you know exactly what you're trying to achieve and you're going to do that. So if it's kicking from hand, um, for distance, well, that's what you do. If it's kicking from hand for your short kicking game, well, that's what you do. And you try to give yourself, a, try and grade yourself afterwards and say, well, well, that was, you know, my grubbers were good, but my kick pass was poor. My left foot uh, grubber was great. My right foot kick pass was, wasn't good enough. So what do I need to do? How do, I ne- how do I need to get better? How do I need to fix that? You know what I mean? And, and, and go from there. Thanks, Rich. Uh, just one more question, and we'll probably let you off the hook then, Richie, because it's been an hour and 15 minutes now. This has come up a good few times tonight, so what do you think about the proposed impact of the 50-22 kicking rule or law when we get, when we get back on the field? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, firstly, it's very much a proposed uh, law. There's no real sign of it coming in um, as in over in the foreseeable future. I don't think it has a, as big an impact on the game as people may think. There's, in phase play, there's two people in those corners anyway. And you don't necessarily need any more than two people in the corners to stop them from kicking the ball in general play. I think where it comes in, where it, where it does change is set piece and mainly scrum. Scrum in midfield, it's actually quite easy to get a pass to the left or the right side of the scrum in your own half and kick the ball and bounce it out in the touch in, in, in the 22. So that's where I would see the, the biggest change. And I suppose from a, from a defensive point of view, you're going to have to decide on whether you defend the running play or the kicking play. Um, and I would think, I would think people will, will, will still try to sort of defend the running side of it first uh, because there's a skill level, obviously, of bouncing the ball out. Now, the, the funny thing is, is that they're doing it to try and open up play. But if we actually bounce the ball out inside the 22, uh, especially in the senior game, what do you think is coming next? It's, it's going to be a mall. So there's actually less, less uh, open play, in my opinion. Uh, that's, so, the, that's the answer I want. But thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> Another mall for Decky. <laughs> <laughs> Look... I think we'll wrap it up there. That was fantastic. Um, really, really appreciate your time, Richie. Thanks for sharing and openly sharing some of your knowledge and experience. Um, thank you to Damien. Thank you to Simon and, and to Michael for organising behind the scenes as well. 
So look, we'll share the slides, guys, tomorrow because I want to follow up with the tactical periodization slides as well with people. They'll be all sent out tomorrow. So the two blocks of slides will be sent out with the video links as well, hopefully. The video for this might be a few days later. All right, so thanks again, Richie. Thanks to everyone who attended. We had up to about 300 people, I can see, participants. So I hope we all learned something. Uh, take care and be safe. So thank you. Cheers, thanks, guys. Richie. Thanks, thanks everyone else. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you.